concerning Pastor Burfine's presentation of a few weeks ago. Maybe you could, if you can't think of any burning questions, you could give us an insight that you went aha about that you were especially glad to hear from Pastor Burfine. Can't say I was too surprised. I did. I wow. slogged through it. I'm going to have to reread it though because a lot of it went yeah. the first time. Yeah, the book is encyclopedic. Well, it's amazing that, that one guy wrote that. You know, it wasn't a collaborative effort, but but he wrote it, and he and he lived and breathed his re research, and it just came out of him when he gave his presentation. You know, that was pretty spontaneous and off the cuff. I, I guess the one thing that um, I've found interesting about it was how the Bible and when he was talking, it's, I mean, it's like Marxism 101. It's just, it's weird. So it's like Gnosticism, and then Karl Marx just kind of grabbed the idea and oh, went with it. I, I don't know. And, I and, and what, what, what parallel do you see between the Gnosticism and Marxist ideology? I think it's just that the... I agree with you, by the I, way. I, yeah, I think it's just that the, like the, the people, they think they have all the answers. And, you know, we're going to put our, we're going to be at one collective, and, you know, the one mindset, and, you know, you have to be on board with us or else. Kind of. and, right, and there, there's this, like, mob mentality, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a collective uh, upheaval against the, the powers that are, the powers that be. And, and uh, um, you know, Marx believed that this was a universal uh, value, that the worker would rise up against the owners of the, the means of production and, and the lower classes would rise against their overlords and overtake them. Uh, but it didn't, it didn't quite work. If, if anything in history would have facilitated that, it would have been World War I. And so the communists went, well, we had our revolution and everything. What happened to it? It all died out. And then they had to find other oppressive systems that, that people would, 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 uh, would war against. Uh, and, and so um, Marxism is a destruction of the political uh, status quo with the belief that out of the people would come a universal good or a, 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 a utopian, a utopia on earth. And the Gnostic counterpart to that is that what they're talking about in political systems is all of creation. That all of creation is meant to oppress uh, those who are divine. And, and, and uh, remember he talked about archons, that uh, this evil deity had set these gatekeepers to keep everything oppressed so that, you know, us pastors are the archons here in the you know keeping people down but but that was uh you know that was a predominant um post medieval view of the catholic church and in some case i mean in some instances or in some uh contexts it was true you had a tyranny and an illegitimate authority vesting itself over and against the people of the church it was a tyranny but does that mean Luther was a Bolshevik or a Gnostic or a Marxist? No, because he was not against authority. He was against illegitimate authority. And so, you know, the blessing that we have in the church, I think the Reformation issue was the authority of Scripture. The, the right authority in church is the Word of God and none other, Pope, pastor, layperson, or whatever, no one has authority over the word of God. So it isn't a toppling of the system. It's a re reformation or reclaiming of God's system in which God is in control of his people. And in the civil realm, it's, it's the same way. You know, in the civil realm of the, of the kingdom of power, the law is a good thing. The law keeps evil in check and preserves life. But there are going to be people that abuse that uh, authority, just as the Pope and, and the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, and in other ways, uh, proper authorities usurped in the Church. It is also done in the secular realm. So is there such a thing as 
civil tyranny? Yeah, but you can recognize it. You can see it. And if you can see the tyranny, you can see that there must also be good rule. We used to have it here in America. <laughs> you know, the rule of the law was supposed to be a protection for those who do good and a threat for those who do evil. And now uh, occasionally rioting in the streets is acceptable and, and is in the name of social justice. These people can, can uh, go into other people's properties and loot it because someone in their past was looted by someone else. And so in social justice and equity, since that happened to them, it should happen the other way around. We should look the other way. Even though my mother taught me that two wrongs don't make a right. But in social justice, two wrongs make it right. Mom, can't you teach them better? Yeah. I think that was part of it too. Is, first of all, it's it's so violent. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the whole system, you know, is this very. Um, uh, it's constant. You constantly have to be destroying things, um, and that was sort of how he was presenting it. Is like, you because any anything that's put on you, you can destroy because it's it's trying to it's a barrier to you. It's evil. Right. Evil should be destroyed. And so I mean, you know, so and and the idea of the rioting, well, <coughs> technically, the, you know, they're just, they're just doing what comes naturally because they're taking back what's theirs, because you just didn't know it was theirs. <laughs> you, you having it, and, and I guess that makes sense with even having wealth, is your wealth is oppressing other people because they don't have it, and they think they should, and because their world, I mean, again, this, that, that was the confusing part to me, is, well, if it's not in... If my world isn't how I desired it, then I can, you know, get out of it. I can take your things. I can, you know, become what I'm supposed to be. Well, and, and uh, in Gnosticism, that is a divine right. Right. Because you have the light element of divinity in you, and if someone is keeping you from what you think you ought to have, it's an oppressive system <laughs> that has to right. be gotten rid of. It's right. It's standing in the way of God, me. Right. Well, that's that's like Marx's theology is by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's crystal clear. The ends justify and, the means, right? Right. And I read a book I took out of uh, Dilbert High's library about Karl Marx and read that, and it was just amazing. I don't. I wish I knew the exact title of it because the person who wrote about it was talking about Marx and how this man was the epitome of laziness. Yeah. <laughs> He was a lazy individual. He didn't and work a day in his life. Yeah, he could not. <laughs> his dad was a lawyer. Yeah, his dad was a lawyer. And he sent him to college to be a lawyer. Well, that's a lot of work, dad. <laughs> I'll have none of this. <laughs> so he started putting the hatred out on those who had money. You know, it was the whole defying your parent kind of thing. And he was a drinker and, you know, rebellious. And so he comes up with this whole communist idea. <laughs> Shares it with a friend, his friend, and I wish I could think of his friend's name. Maybe you Engel? Know. Yeah, I bet that was probably it. Engel. I mean, that's another proponent of Marxism. I don't know. Well, he took off running with it, and he got some other people involved. So they come to Karl Marx and say, hey, we want you to put together this manifesto. And so, they, you know, with a certain time, and time goes on, and nothing's produced, and they come, come to him again, and nothing's produced, and they, come, they go, look, <laughs> you have until, like, February, blah, blah, blah. To get it out or kick you out of the organization. You can kick him out of his own organization. That's how easy I was. So we finally coughed it all. <laughs> this wow. guy was just like, no wonder you want communism. You just want everybody to give to you and you don't want to produce. Well, he sponged anything. off relatives and his wife's relative. I think he had a maid that he never paid and he had some children by the maid. And <laughs> It's all very Gnostic. You know. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. And that's the part that, that really. Are you talking about Nazism or are you talking about Marxism <laughs> when, he was, when he was giving his thing? Yeah. Okay. I didn't know anything about Nazism. And I think that's what is hard for me is it's like, I don't know, it's like touching slime, you know? It just like moves out of the way, you know, and like becomes nothing when you when you try to put anything into it. And so every time I try to think about it, it's just like, you know, <laughs> you're like pushing into slime. Yeah. I don't know what I'm pushing at. I don't know what I'm fighting. I don't, because it just moves and you know, yeah 
and again, I thought I thought Pastor Burfine did a great job of of saying that even language right is yeah. part of, is part of the evil construct. And that's it. Yeah. And and so if you try to use language against it, it'll just deconstruct everything that right. you say. It'll it'll redefine the words. Um, uh, and again, I'm thinking of um, <clears throat> who's this guy that that um, in the '60s, Saul Alinsky. Who the rules for radicals? Uh, never heard of it. Sixties in this? Yeah, it was back in the six fifties and sixties, I think. And and uh, Saul Alinsky was like Hillary Clinton's hero. I mean, she did her master's thesis at, for an advanced degree on Saul Alinsky. I think she even met the guy once or twice. But uh, but but um, Alinsky had these rules for radicals, and and what he said was. Whatever they accuse you of, accuse them right back. And make them live by their rules. In other words, there was always an answer. So if, if, if you accuse the communists of doing this, they'll accuse you back and try to find ways of making it stick. Which makes sense. And, and again, as, as you're saying about Gnosticism, I, w I went down the squirrel hole on YouTube on the on the Frankfurt movement. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but the Frankfurt movement was a group of Jewish scholars who were basically communists in Germany. And you know the the conflict between uh, Hitler and the other faction in Germany were both left wing. There was fascism and there was communism, and the fascists were against the communists. Remember, Hitler went to war with Russia. You, you, they're, they're both leftists. So it was socialism and communism. And, and so the, many of the Jews were, were into communism. In fact, if you look at the founding of Israel in 1947 or 48, whenever it was, it was based on a communist system. They had kibbutzes, uh, kibbutz and, and communes and, and that sort of thing. And, and, the, and the, the big upheaval in Israel in the 1970s is because there were actually some Bible-believing Jews that came in, and, and people like Netanyahu are people that actually believe the Bible. And so if you look at Jew Jewish politics now in Israel, it's like Netanyahu, who's a Bible believer, although he's a Jew, against the communists that are there. Well, at any rate, um, when, the co when the, these Jewish communists in Germany in the 1930s began to be threatened, they came to America. And they basically took over a lot of the university system. And uh, the, some of the great scholars in the 50s and 60s are part of this Frankfurt movement. And, and what they're into is deconstruction, which, which, which is this Gnostic thing. And, and I always thought, you know, Hegel and the you know, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, I, I always thought it was just this dialogue that would come by and then some some truth would come out of it. But, but Hegel actually believed that, that the two opposing sides had to destroy each other and that out of the destruction, some truth would come. And that's what you see in, in radicalism, destruction with the hope that something good will come. And so you've got the radicals against the authorities or the administration and, they, and they're supposed to destroy each other, and destroying each other uh, gets rid of the past, so it's um, cancel, cancel culture, mm -hmm. and it's supposed to give way to this utopia. Where there's no longer oppression, but heaven on earth. Thank you, Laurie. You launched us into a, a great discussion. <laughs> Jerry, anything that you got especially out of uh, Burfine's uh, presentation that you... No, I, I guess... One thing is I wonder how many people really approach it kind of as the religion aspect. Because they, they just want to live their life. And they really mm -hmm. don't care what the people do or, or care about religion or care about even background of this. It's like I'm gonna do what I want to do. Yeah. No, no, th and and uh, that's that's a brilliant observation because I think it was Sue Owens that also in the break came up to me and I don't I know lots of people that are into these movements. 
they don't believe in this Belteshazzar or whoever the, the, the and, and and I said, well, right, but but what he was presenting is a religious framework that embraces what people are naturally doing now. And so there are some people that want a spiritual uh, reason for these things. <coughs> and they're given it in Gnosticism. Others, and, and the Gnostic would say, well, they don't have to know our theology because words don't mean anything anyway. As long as they're following what we say ought to be done, they're Gnostics and they're with us. And, and that's one thing, too, that, that I've read in Gnosticism before Pastor Burfine's presentation. And, and he may have said it. I missed, I missed a lot of it. But if you look at Gnostic systems in the ancient world, no two of them are alike. So when he's naming these names, other systems may have different names for them or may have a slightly different system. But it's not the system that's important. It's the fact that you got buy-in by people. And people, and Jerry, your observation is exactly right. People resonate with this. They say we should rise up against all this tyranny. We should get rid of all of the evil that's, that's there. And if there are evil people, we ought to get rid of them too. Although they would never point to themselves and say, like me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> got to get pe rid of people like me. So. Well, that's, I think, why it's become, it's popular. That, that's the that's the strange part to me is you know the popularity of all this you know of the um, <clears throat> what, whatever you call it. I mean again I, I don't I don't watch the news because I don't think it's worth it anymore. But um, but you know you have this woke stuff and and then people I don't I think you're right I don't think they look at this but somehow it, it they believe it. It resonates. It, yeah, the, the, they, they're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. It's like, well, how does that make sense? <laughs> why, why does that make sense to you? And I think that, you know, for them, they're just like, well, you know, and maybe they never heard it, but they're like, oh, yeah. And that, yeah, so that, I think that's really what's, it's become a cultural um, reality for many people is that, oh, this is just, yeah, that makes, that's, that's right. And some of the new age stuff that comes in fits right along with this. Mm -hmm. I don't know, have you ever heard of group mind? I mean, there are people that say that through some esoteric exercise that you can tie into um, all knowledge. Um, you can tie into the universal mind. And, and this is a Gnostic concept, you know, tying into the, into the uh, monad or, or the deity. Um, but they wouldn't say that they're religious. They don't know exactly what they are. But they, they have this hope of doing something, having some spiritual exercise, and tying into these supernatural powers. You hear of out-of-body out of experiences and, and uh, uh, people making telegraphic readings where supposedly they leave their bodies and can go and find people and that sort of thing. All that is Gnosticism. It's, it's my spirit can leave my body and do what it wants and leave the body behind. But, I, but it's thoroughly demonic. Because, again, as Burfine says in his book, the real, r the real sign if you're a Gnostic, if you ask a Gnostic, uh, do you have a body? They'll say, I have a body. But a believer will say, I am a body. See, the idea of I have a body is that the body is material and expendable. But we can't talk about the essence of our being without a body. And that's one of the main differences. Okay. I think that might, you might address that in this preface because I just kind of re reread the preface. Yeah. Oh, uh, there's so much in that. Book. Well, if you'd like, I've got some Bible passages we could maybe look at with mm -hmm. connection with this. I just want to make one comment about what you, what you were saying earlier um, regarding people getting involved in like false religions and stuff. It's so important that Christians know their Bibles because otherwise it doesn't matter what church you walk into. You can't, how can you identify false teaching if you don't read the word? And the other thing is, um, in a similar sense, the, our, our, our country. People need to know the Constitution. How can you know when it's being violated if people don't know the Constitution? It's, we need to know. <laughs> 
<laughs> you're right. Well, you're assuming that language has meaning. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that, that's, that's the whole thing, isn't right. it? I mean, that's exactly opposite of what you're saying. The Gnostic, don't read your Bible. Don't read the Constitution. It's all artificial constructs, and it's all evil. It's all my feel. That's how I that's, that's felt. Well, and you were talking about Marx. For people who are too lazy intellectual to, intellectually to pick up a book, this is very attractive. Mm -hmm. It's just how I feel and, and what we all naturally think. We don't need books and teachers and that sort of thing. We're all on board. Mm -hmm. Universal mind. Well, and that's... Um, you know, my college days were postmodernism. And so that was all my... F I still have friends who are affected by postmodernism, and that was... That's exactly what this is. That your truth is your truth, and mine is mine. Mm -hmm. But I still had I, I had I had conversations about this when I was in college with all these people. Some of them professors who you know, they were they were pushing a lot of this. But they, they it wasn't labeled this. It was labeled postmodernism or philosophy. Mm -hmm. Well, and when I was in college, which is a little bit before you, <laughs> we were in the flower of rationalism. And so when I went to my Lutheran college they deconstructed the Bible. They gave us the J-E-D-P mm -hmm. and, and uh, used reason in order to pick apart the Bible and to deconstruct it. And that's what rationalism does. And the result of rationalism is postmodernism despair. Because you can, you can rationalize the Bible and do what you want with it, and the best you can do is destroy it, and then where, where are you at? What do you got? Ah. And uh, you, what you said reminded me of one of Pastor Zwanitzer's favorite statements. He was sort of the founder of the apologetics conference and everything. And he would say, you know how the, in the government they have FBI guys that are experts at knowing um, uh, uh, fake money and that sort of thing. Do you know how they do it? It's not by taking a course and finding out all the different ways. They, they do it by handling a lot of real money. And then just by handling the real money, when they handle false money, they know that it's not right. And that's what you're saying about the doctrine. Mm -hmm. To recognize false doctrine, you better be handling a lot of good doctrine <laughs> to recognize it. All right. So I just got a definition. Gnosticism is a prominent heretical movement of the second century Christian church, partly of pre-Christian origin. Gnostic doctrine taught that the world was created and ruled by a lesser divinity, the Demiurge, and that Christ was an emissary of the remote supreme divine being, that is, esoteric knowledge or gnosis, of whom enabled the redemption of the human spirit from the evil material world. So in, in uh, Gnosticism, the material world is evil, the creator of the material world is a demiurge that was astray and was evil in and of itself. And then he talked about, Burfine talked about Sophia uh, being the, the, the uh, demiurge, female demiurge that gave birth or abortion or whatever it was to this creator of the material world. And so she came in the form of a snake to re try to remind, to woke Adam and Eve as to who they were. They were really gods because they had the light element trapped in the evil material. So salvation and redemption was through the gnosis or knowledge of the divinity trapped in the material world, the body, which is evil, creation. The goal is to ascend through knowledge against the evil system of creation that would keep us away from monad. The goal is for the spirit to ascend above the created orders and divisions to return to the pleroma, which means uh, in Greek fullness, in the unity of the monad. Certain people, though, are thoroughly evil and material with no light in them to be awakened to. These are irredeemable and can be destroyed to no harm. In contrast to this, God has revealed all people are created in God's image that is tarnished by sin and can be redeemed, so should not be destroyed. So in Gnosticism, if someone won't be woke, it's because they have no light in them. They are just material. There's no div divinity sown in them. And so they're excluded from the Gnostic Church. And being purely material, they're hated, 
and you can get rid of them. So find the unenlightened and get rid of them, leave them behind. There's nothing redeemable in them. And we want to contrast that to the Christian worldview in which all people, even Hitler, Genghis Khan, and anyone else that you can name, was created in the image of God but were fallen through the sin of Adam and Eve and therefore had evil in them. And the fact that all are created in the image of God means that all can be redeemed. If we can be redeemed, they can be redeemed too. So we don't go around killing them. We preach to them the gospel so that they might be redeemed. See the difference in strategy? In Gnosticism, you can destroy your enemy. In Christianity, you love your enemy and serve them in order that they might be saved. This is turning the other cheek. It's an interesting word, isn't that what Cody used to describe Trumpists? What was that? Redeemable? Yeah. yeah <coughs> well, again, it, this, again, this is the blessing and the curse of learning about Gnosticism. You will hear it everywhere. And yeah, I think that is plainly a Gnostic view, that people are irredeemable. So for Certain them, people. Oh, yeah, right. Mm-hmm. No, no, you're, you're fine. Um, for, so for them, I, no, I'm, I'm trying to, because I, I, I always think of Luther's enthusiasm, right? So you have this idea of revelation that's given not by an objective truth like the scriptures, but instead by some, you know, some truth within me. Um, and so, and enthusiasm it, literally means God in me, right? Oh yeah, and theos. Yeah, right, right. Oh, and See, sometimes English words I forget that they're. Connected. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, and theos. Um, so, uh, so I, I guess that's what I'm. I'm trying to connect is okay. So, it sounds like this is just one way you could go with it. So, you know, enthusiasm in general could produce this. Mm-hmm. Because it's just a system that you sort of came out of. I think it will invariably produce this. Or yeah, and that's what I'm wondering: is this an equation of enthusiasm with this idea? Um, Yeah. Because it it seems like enthusiasm could invent anything. I mean, you know, once you get into this, once you get outside of objective truth and outside of Christ, you just chaos and confusion. Well, and and again, in a Gnostic system. The enthusiast spouting his enthusiasm doesn't even have to necessarily mean anything to anyone because it's just words. But he's effusing the fact that God is in him. God told me. Okay, so so, so enthusiasm would be just another way that they... I, I mean, again, in my definition, enthusiasm is anything coming from within you as opposed to knowledge coming from outside. Yeah, but, but it's also then the, the, the claim of divinity. Mm-hmm. So right, it's, it's, right. it's the claim of divinity within which is Gnosticism. Right, yeah. So uh, again, there, there may be some f- uh, subtle differences, but I, I think in its essence it's really the you same. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that's what I was wondering, is, is, is this sort of the, the unity of these two? Because again, I, mm-hmm. once you go down this path, you know, there, there's, there's nothing to tell you. If there's no, if there's no objective... Truth. There's nothing to tell you that this is wrong, or that this could be wrong, or that you can be wrong. I mean, you you give up all um, all standard. There's there's no there's no measurement. Well, you d- again, you don't need a standard if you're in that camp, because uh, listen to the enthusiasts and what they claim to say, and they'll be mutually exclusive. There'll be a, a, a exact contradictions, mm-hmm. but the people but that care. are following them accept them both. Well, they, well, and again, because the language doesn't matter, and that's what makes it ring to me of um, of Luther and enthusiasm. Because again, I, I, it just th- these are the more familiar pictures I'm, I'm used to. So you have the Catholic Church, right, and, and they're enthusiasts because they have the Pope, and he is divine, right. And so their enthusiasm is a certain kind because it's coming from him. For the um, for those who are sort of radical Zwingli, Pentecostal, that's what we call them today. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, again, their enthusiasm is not from the Pope, but inside of them. And so, again, Luther's fighting both of these. But the funny thing is he doesn't label them differently. He labels them the same. He says Zwingli, who's totally against the Catholic Church, um, is an enthusiast. And so is the Catholic Church, who's totally against Zwingli. And, the, and these two systems just sort of exist, but they're both 
coming from the same idea that you know what's in me and I, it's coming out of me and again one is the pope but the other is the individual but it's just to me it's it's you know, well and and this is the uh, this is the rap on on Luther that that's that's made by Roman Catholics he, he took he took a system where there's one pope and developed a system where there are countless popes <laughs> right and the one who really brought this together well is Father Serducci on Saturday Night Live. When he said, hey, I broke away from my church. I wanted a promotion. I just wanted to be a little Monsignor, and they wouldn't give it to me, so I broke with them. And I have my own church now. In my church, everybody's a Pope. <laughs> <laughs> you can buy this hat. <laughs> yeah. See, that's what we do, and I think that we'd all be fine. <laughs> Just walk around with both hands. I thought Pastor Bruce did a good job in like, going through history and pointing out all these different movements, and he did bring in the revivalist movement. Yes. Yes. Things, so. yes. Yeah. And that so was. I think that's a good time. Yeah. And he did so, I mean, it's just encyclopedic. The, the thing that strikes me, too, is he talked about the troubadours. Mm, yeah, the, 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 the middle-aged troubadours, and they're singing about some peasant marrying this woman that was beyond their station. Oh, yeah. That, okay. Yeah. That's, the, that's the popular the troubadour. Love, right? Yeah, yeah, this is Sophia, right. you know. Mm -hmm. And you see this in, in uh, modern entertainment all the time. Yeah, it's, again, the curses, you see it everywhere. Okay, so I, I had to get the enthusiasm thing settled in my mind. Now I'm, I'm, I'm in a better situation. Here. I'm glad you brought... I was holding these two things and like, enthusiasm is different. No, I, I know it's all just one big mess. So I, I'm glad you brought, brought that in. <laughs> but but uh, again, my, the my thesis or my theory on this is, is that Gnosticism is the default fallen religion of man. Well, that's what I was going to aim at. Because that's because that's where Luther goes with enthusiasm. Is it's just it's just me as God. Yeah. I mean, it's yep. And that's what these popular okay. movements are, okay. right? The fallen human heart. Okay. So the Gnostic secret answer is in the divinity in us. That which is imposed from outside of us is all a part of the evil system. This is the exact opposite of Christianity which states that the problem is not outside us, but in us, and the solution is not in us, but outside us. So it's just, it's just flip-flop of the truth. And anything that's not of true Christianity is no same. Right. And he doesn't really care which lie you buy. He'll sell you all of them. Mm -hmm. oh, it doesn't matter which flavor you take. He's just like, oh, you're not following God. It's not good. But as, 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 as Pastor was, was telling us, they will all just flip the word on its head. They, they will all take issue with the word of God and give you what is opposite to it. And how many, how many ways can the word uh, be opposed? An infinite number of ways. And so you'll have an infinite varieties of, of, uh, of errors and one truth. Uh, so uh, just as a Bible back up there, uh, to see that the evil comes from us. Jesus says in Matthew 15, 15, Are you still without understanding? Do you not understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. So again, that which is evil is not from outside of us, but from within us. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So there Christ identifies the problem of man is in him, not outside of him. It is in him, out of the heart. The answer isn't in by foraging around inside of you. There you only find the problem. No answer. And then Romans 3.21, St. Paul says, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So it's talking about universal evil, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
and that the righteousness of God through faith in Christ, look at the prepositions in that part that's emphasized, to and on. And what preposition is missing? In and from. So to all is a directionality from outside of us to us, and on all from outside on top of us, not from inside out, right? So it's a gift that comes to us from the outside, not something that is earned or innate to our insides. It's a gift from the outside. So Lutherans like to talk about extra nos outside of us. Now that doesn't mean that Christ isn't also in us. But in us is Christ fighting with our flesh. And so there's an ambiguity within us. You said there was two purposes in missing in and what was the other one? And from. You could add, you could add a bunch of other prep, prepositions. Prepositions are words of position or relation. So to all and on all. Some Bible passages we might consider. First of all, for, uh, John 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, filled with grace and truth. So the word became flesh. And that's we call that the uh, personal union, right? Or the hypostatic union. That Jesus, the word, the eternal word, became flesh. And so if the word, which is God, became flesh, can flesh be evil? Well, if, if it was, then the death of his flesh does us no good. Because you got something evil dying for something evil. <clears throat> or he would have become evil. Right. He became flesh, truly. So the word became flesh. And... Um, Again, one of, I remember one of my semprofs saying that that first <clears throat> chapter of St. John can be, can be read by a Gnostic and he can nod his head and say, yes, that's true, yes, that's true, yes, that's true. Maybe sometime we could take, take a half hour or an hour to go through that. Until you get to John 1.14 where it says, and the word became flesh. And the Gnostics say, impossible. Because flesh is evil, it's material. So the word cannot become evil and material. Pastor Burkine mentioned the world, the flesh and the devil as being our enemies, but flesh not meaning material flesh. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Flesh meaning, yeah, when John uses flesh besides Jesus' flesh, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. It's, uh, that, that flesh is talking about fallen man, fallen flesh. That which is born of flesh is flesh. But Jesus is not born of flesh. He's born of the Spirit. Did a man conceive him? No, the Spirit conceived him. He is not conceived of the flesh like us. Okay? Then First John 4, 1 through 6. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. And he, this should probably be underlined. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And that has come is a perfect verb in the Greek which means it took place in the past, he was conceived in the flesh, and it is durative, it continues even to now. Jesus still is in his flesh, the same flesh born of the Virgin Mary. And if flesh is evil, then Jesus is in evil. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was, uh, from us was coming, and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak uh, as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of evil. 
So we can only hear the word of God when we are born again, when we become children of God. Otherwise, the flesh listens to its spiritual father, which is not the heavenly father, but the devil and his lies. So Gnosticism is the spirit of Antichrist because it says that Christ did not come in the flesh because flesh and material world is evil. Now, here's, here's where it may get confused. Is our flesh evil? And what's the difference be, be, between being evil and corrupt, as you're saying? I think you're onto, you're onto some very careful distinctions there. <laughs> Without Christ, we can be evil. With Christ, we fight against it. Yeah, we still have flesh, right? Um, but the flesh is corrupt. And, and with that, you, you've got it right. That's what original sin is. It is a corruption or a lack of righteousness that we're born with, and therefore we are sinful. So our flesh is evil, not by its nature, but by the corruption that is in it. And that's a, that's a, a careful distinction we're making, because is God the creator of evil? No. Is he the creator of our flesh? Yes. So our flesh, in and of itself, cannot be evil. But it is born in corruption. In sin did my mother conceive me, David says. And so it is evil by corruption, not by nature. And that's why uh, God can cleanse us of that sin. But what we're saying in this is true for everybody. It's not just us that ha have the potential for being good because of God's grace. Everyone does because Jesus died for everybody. So we don't ask Pierce, are you, um, are, are you um, enlightened and born again so that you'll listen to me? No, we preach them the gospel and baptize so that they can be born again. Now I'm a little bit confused because a few weeks ago you were talking about put up your hand. And, and Did I say that? Okay, no, you said that's not the problem. Well, what what does it mean flesh. to but what now what? You're saying you're corrupt through and through with heart and flesh. Right, and we should so, we should okay. we should cut off or we should pluck out our eye and we should cut off our hand, right. but how do we do it? We do it by denying ourselves. Mm -hmm. We do not defend the sin of our hand, but we cast it away from us as sin and cast it on Jesus, mm -hmm. who bore a, who bore it on the cross. And if we have an evil eye, we pluck it out. How? By denying what our eyes see. Oh, that person is evil. Um, we, we deny what our eyes see and cast it upon Christ who died with it and for it so that we can be forgiven and restored. So what Jesus is saying by that is to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. Don't affirm the sin that your hand commits. You you got on that this morning in the sermon with the idea of spiritual po poverty, that we do not take pride in what we do. We have no pride at all in what we do, and so we stand before God as pop paupers, uh, nothing nothing to boast about. Well, another way of thinking of the, the distinction, our our confessions use the idea of leprosy, and we know the difference between leprosy and a person who has leprosy. And yet, if you were to try to take them apart, you couldn't because they're sick, and, and because the, it's so it's so in their flesh that, that you can't separate the two. Um, and yet, we know that the person isn't leprosy itself, but rather a person, and yet they are sick with leprosy. So it, it's just sort of a helpful thing to think through. I am through and through corrupt with sin, and yet I am not sin itself. 
but I am guilty of it and I am corrupted by it. Just like we would say the leper is, not leprosy itself, but is corrupted by it and is sick with it. And so, of course, we know that the, the leper could be separated from leprosy. Although we may not have the power to do it, we know that th that's, we, we see that someone, and now we see Christ, who is who does not have original sin, and so, so it is possible, but we cannot do it. And so that's that's then the distinction, is the corruption is so deep in us that we cannot get rid of it. I, I'm like a little kid in that, at times I tend to fall back to concrete thinking, that's what I was obviously doing when you were talking about kind of the handoff. Yeah, you'd be left limbless. If you... <laughs> and we, in a way, we should be left without a leg to stand on before God. So. No, I meant I was making a distinction between your fleshly body and the sin that came out of you. Yes. Because of my kind of thinking. Yes. I don't know why I do that, but every once in a while I get caught up on that. Well, and again, I think Pastor Walworth described it well. That's it's, a good it's, it, yeah, it's, it's hard to divorce the two because yes. the, the flesh is corrupted by that sin. So you can't speak abstractly about sin without having a sinner connected to it. Well, and that's, and, and even our confessions have meant that the only way that we can even, we can't make it is when we act, we cannot distinguish between uh, our good and our sin within our flesh, so that when my hand acts as a sinner, it's always simple. Um, and so God either has to impute righteousness to me, or I remain. You know, but the only way we as Christians can see that is because Jesus told us. That's the only way to, that's the only way to divide it. And, I mean, that, you know, we, can't, we can't do it by reason. Our sinful flesh still wants to make distinctions. That's right. <laughs> well, and and again, the you know the Nagel definition of the good work was it's a work that's forgiven. That's right. Yeah. I mean, and, and 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 God even claims it, right? We are His workmanship, created for good works, and so He He then works in us. But again, if we tried to claim it outside of Christ, it would be sinful. And we have, everything done outside of Christ is or outside of faith is sin, which is crazy. Ganz recht. Um, Romans 1, 18 through 22. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Now, again, the reason I brought that passage forward, there may be other good reasons to apply it to Gnosticism, is that does St. Paul here believe that the Creator and his creation are evil? No, according to these words, God, a good God manifested glory, which is a good thing. He manifested his glory in the creation so that men who turn from it are without excuse. So far from hiding the monad or the good God behind this evil creation, Paul is saying that God and his goodness are revealed in creation, his glory. Anything else we want to bring out in that text? Well, I think that, again, the whole point is suppression of the truth. And that's that's where it's that's coming from, and so that's you know the driving force behind denying creation is to suppress the truth of creation. And where does this suppression come from? Within. From from within. <laughs> from within man, right? That's right. So it's God is revealing His right. glory, and the suppression isn't this oppressive system around me. It's the oppression of man denying the revelation. So again, it's. Flipped on its head. That was brilliant. Yeah. <laughs>
credit where so credit right. is credit <laughs> is where credit is due. Right. right. All right. No, that's right. But it's, it's great that those two are together in the same state. Yeah. The yeah. Creation and the suppression. Are, yeah. Um, yeah. Who who's the oppressor here? It's man oppressing the knowledge of God. Uh, Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Does that talk about any redemption that's in us or our need for redemption? Yeah, our need for redemption. The answer isn't in us. The sin is in us and the answer comes toward us. There's another preposition, toward us. He demonstrates his own love toward us. Christ died for us. Extranos, outside of us. Did he wait for us to be woke or good? <laughs> no, while we were yet sinners. Well, and I think that might be another aspect of Christ's death. Is it, it's a universal atonement. There is no one outside of Christ's death. And of course, for, for this idea to be, you know, propagated, you have to think that there are those who are outside of God's grace, or that some some didn't deserve it, or somehow God's is limited, you know, but for us there there is no enemy. All have now become those who are redeemed. And so yes, there are unbelievers, but they're not to be hated, they're to be pitied and, and mercy is to be given to them, and we are to forgive them. Uh, and even, you know, desire to save them because it's it's a universal grace and so again he, here here it is you've got universals one the the, uh, the the way of man is one we are all sinners the way of salvation is one and Gnosticism wants to get rid of divisions and here we've got divisions taken away all people are the same as sinners and all are redeemed in Christ and they introduce the division some are enlightened and some are outside so in the name of getting rid of divisions they take away the Christian unity and impose their own division well it's you know Tony pointed that out right when, when he said well the Gnostics when they explain this do they use words <laughs> that's one of my favorites I had read in this book by um, some philosopher called Stanley Fish. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's some postmodernist. And as I'm reading this, it's you know he's he makes this ludicrous statement that uh, that words can't have meaning. And I, I can't help but this is an absolute everything you just said. What are you said, talking for? Unless it had meaning, I wouldn't understand what you're saying. Why are you? The book is like this big, <laughs> and so for someone who thinks the words don't have meaning. He certainly writes a lot of them. But again, it's this idea of, you know, well, you know, uh, there, there cannot be this universal truth, you know, and, and in their denial of it, they, they deny themselves. Well, again, if you don't believe in words, stop talking. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Luther, what was... Uh, the what was Luther's... Um, he said, you know, for all these who think that... Uh, the Holy Spirit didn't write down the things in Scripture. You know, it seems like they've uh, they've swallowed the Holy Spirit feathers and all, yeah. uh, and then they can't stop writing and talking. You know, it'd be better for them to just shut up if they think that the Holy Spirit is direct revelation, right? Yeah. What do, why does it? Why do you have to talk? Yeah, you're mucking it up. Let the Holy Spirit do it perfectly. One last Bible passage: First Corinthians 15, the Great Resurrection chapter. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Sounds Gnostic. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Now he's going to tell what the change is. For the perishable must clothe itself with imperishable and the mortal with immortality. Does that mean we're getting rid, just those words in verse 53, does that mean we're getting rid of our bodies or that something is being placed on our bodies? 
It's the latter, right? This perishable, this flesh, must put on imperishable, and the mortal must clothe itself with immortal. I'm using the Old King James because that's this is the funeral, this is the committal liturgy, so I've, I've got it so firm in my mind. The, the mortal must uh, put on immortality. When the perishable has, clo- has been clothed with imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Oh, and here's the mocking song to death and, and the grave. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus. So does that say that the goal of the Christian is to escape his body? No, it's that his body be clothed in immortality, which means that it cannot die and will live forever, to be as Christ's body is. So th- this, this brought up one of my favorites, because I always connect this with, uh, with Luke. And, uh, and Luke does this. Now, Paul is uh, seen to be sort of behind Luke's gospel. Um, so this is, this is Luke, uh, Luke 24. <clears throat> now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hand and his feet. While they still did not believe for joy and marvel, he said to them, Have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate it in their presence. I just, my favorite is that he says flesh and bones. And it's true. It, it, he actually uses the word bones in the, in the Greek. And, and so, again, Christ has his body. Right. And this, and is, this is what we will put on. Yeah. I, we will have the same flesh. And what that means, we haven't a clue what it's going to be like <laughs> to have bodies that no longer wear out and have aches and pains and get, get ill and and uh, in which we live in God and his kingdom uh, without death and without the stuff uh, that makes life tough now. We don't know what that's going to be like, but we can't wait to find out. So I, I, I bring this passage up because um, there is someone I know who I respect them dearly. And, uh, and one time we were talking, and, and they somehow had stumbled into the idea that we did not have bodies when we rose from the dead. They were they really believed that we did not have a body. And we were just spirit. And and again, this person, I, I hold them dear, and I, I could never imagine this person saying this. And so I was practicing my practice, how do you, what do you, you know, you know, I mean, we say this in the creed all the time. I believe in the resurrection of the body. I mean, we say that. Well, it's a spiritual body. Well, uh... Yes. And it's defined, I mean, <laughs> right. the spiritual body is defined by what we just read. Right, right. But again, it wasn't clicking for them. So when I when I finally read them Luke, and I was like, Jesus said it, a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone. And they finally, oh. oh. Can't argue with that. Right. <laughs> and Jesus said, touch me. <laughs> right. It's the flesh. It's the bones, you know. So... Yeah, but it just but again, connecting back to this Gnostic thing, they just accidentally fallen off into No, it's the natural it's a, it's a natural way to fall in. Right. To think of God as a spirit and I want to be like God, so I want to be a spirit. Well you are a spirit, but you're a spirit with a body. Um, you know, it was interesting. I put to, I tried to put together a paper for Glenn Eden on uh, cremation versus Christian traditions uh, of, of burial and that sort of thing. And when I sort of zoomed around the internet, there were a lot of Christian pastors who said cremation is fine because we're not going to have the same body as we had here on earth. I'm going, oh, you crazy. Crazy. Well, and I, I always check myself because I say, you have a new body, but, but it's probably better to say you will have recycled, a resurrected body. A recycled body. That's, because it's not going to be new, not in the sense that it's going to be different. Um, you have the same body, but without sin. Mm-hmm. And of course, we don't know what that's like because we've always had sin. Only well, perhaps it, it, in our dreams. 
with different in the sense that when Jesus is able to walk through the wall or whatever. So right. it's not confined to what he is now. Well, Scripture said he dis- he he uh, he suffered and died according to the flesh and descended into hell according to the spirit. And and what it's saying by that is that he had a, a human body, but because it is united with divinity, it also receives the the properties of divinity, which means he can go anywhere that he wants unobstructed. Everywhere that God is, Christ in his body can be, and is. Because the, the, the properties of the divinity are given to that whole person because of the personal union. And that's why if we celebrate the Lord's Supper here and at the same time they're doing it in another state, Christ's body is equally present to both of us and received by the communers. Even though by the nature of a human body in and of itself, it can't be in two places at one time. But Christ's body being divine, more can be said of that body than can be said of any of ours. So. There's only people who think that when their loved ones die, that they become angels and they're their guardian angel and oh, they're fucking watching over me and blah blah blah. And I would not want my my parents went through and all in this world. They do not have to sit here and watch over me and say, oh, they <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, no, they they're in heaven, you know. So I don't get, I don't. I think sometimes people just can't let go of their their loved ones because they they um, well what we would want to uh, help them is is to know that Jesus you love that person Jesus loved them even more and Jesus can call them there and we can look forward to a reunion with them but uh, you know we we go through this with our Catholic friends who want to pray in fact I went to a funeral this last week. A Catholic funeral, and one of the prayers was to the departed. And so, uh, again, um, there's there there may be some Gnostic underpinnings that the presence of that person does not depend on their bodies, but it does. Their soul is now with the Lord, according to the Scripture, and their presence with us again will be in the body when that body is raised up. And, and it's in an unnatural state. Right. The, the, see, this is the thing. is it, 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 It's sort of astonishing because we always assume, well, the saints are in glory. And they are. And they're not suffering. But but they aren't done. They're, they're looking forward to the resurrection. They don't want to remain without bodies. And that's sort of what we, what we get wrong when we think of heaven is they are in peace. And they, and they, have, laid be, they, have, they have laid down their sinful flesh. Uh, and praise God for that. Uh, but they're, they're still looking forward, just like the angels, to, you know, just like all creation is looking forward to the resurrection. That's, that's the beginning. The, the martyr souls under the altar in heaven right. cry out, How long, O Lord, how long? Right. I mean, again, we have this idea that, well, you know, now they're, you're, you're, they're separated, and, and, you know, but, but that's, again, it's unnatural. Mm-hmm. That's not the way it's supposed to, and it won't stay that way. Um, they, they, they want their bodies and, and they want to be united bodily uh, with us. So, yeah, I think that's one aspect that we don't explore as much. But I think there are certain religions that draw people with that idea, too. The idea that we have a community with the saints that are in heaven and that they somehow have commerce with us here on earth. I think that's an attractive aspect to, to the flesh, even though we're not promised that. You know, that saints could hear anything or see anything that we're doing. But if we could have spirit guides, <laughs> then we too could escape. <laughs> oh, that's, that's Go to the Indian <laughs> reservation of, and, and walk the wheel of life. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the, the thing that always gets me, though, is that if Luther did this to uh, the nth degree, is it's the objective word. Mm-hmm. It, it is outside of me. It is... It is something that I can, you know, that comes to me. I mean, again, that I think that's the one thing that I'm sort of saying more than anything else is 
If it's not there, then it, it cannot have anything to do with my salvation or have anything to do with my righteous life. And and we have nothing to confess about it. We we can't. And that that in that uh, irregular state between death and resur re resurrection, I think Pieper says you know there's a variety of views of what the soul state is at that point, and people can argue about it, but there's nothing definitive stated in Scripture. So some think that it's like falling asleep, and then on the resurrection day it's like wa waking the next morning and. You're going, just going from death to the resurrection day. Other, others have said that there is a sense of, uh, of uh, a dreamlike sense of being there without the body. Because that's what dreams are. You go someplace manufactured by your, bo your, your uh, brain without your body. Um, so it might be a dreamlike existence for the soul with, with the Lord before the resurrection. And, and, and others have proposed that... Uh, um, you sort of skip skip judgment day altogether. When you die, you're just a citizen in heaven. I don't know where that one comes from, but yeah. but to say anything definitive um, would be enthusiasm because right. God didn't God didn't tell it to us. So we leave people to speculate, and we think well of them. Um, we don't want to uh, put them down or anything, but. We, we speak where scripture speaks and where it's silent. Uh, it's evidently not important for us to know and we don't want to be wrong, so we usually don't say anything then. Wait for God to reveal. What, um, in the Old Testament where it talks about Saul and he goes to... The witch of Endor. Yeah, <laughs> and he has her call it Saul. I mean, yeah, uh, Samuel. How do you explain that? Because Samuel says, why have you disturbed me or something like that? Well, again, I've heard various interpretations. I believe it was a demonic manifestation. And, and Saul in that f gives nothing but accusation to him, which w is what the devil would give. Mm -hmm. Saul does not call him to repentance in that. Oh, Samuel? Samuel, that's, yeah. that's what I meant. I've, I've heard other Lutherans believe that she actually con the Lord allowed the soul to come up, but I, I don't believe that. It's a, appointed for man to die once and then the judgment. So I believe when Samuel died, he went to heaven. And apart from a clear manifestation, a, a witch calling him up does not say to me that this is a divine thing. What about, um, so when Jesus is, Moses and Elijah are Jesus. Mm -hmm. So people have questions about that. Well, again, this is an unusual occurrence that, that happened but once, right? And we believe what Scripture says about it, that it was Moses and Elijah. Elijah was obviously in his body because he went bodily into heaven. Um, Moses, I, I'm not sure. Well, that's really... Um, well, what, what point? Well, evidently, the rich man from hell could see into heaven, and it doesn't say that Lazarus could see him. Although maybe that's maybe that's possible, mm -hmm. but there was a conversation between Abraham and the rich man in hell. And again, was that an encouragement for the rich man or was it a sign of his desolation and uh, looking up into heaven, uh, he, the rich man would have only been in despair and say, I could have been there, but I wasn't, but I wasn't. And it's my fault. And what did he tell him to do? <clears throat> Moses and the prophets. If yeah, they listen, don't believe them. If they don't hear <laughs> Moses and the prophets, right? Oh, but he had his own idea. Oh, what if you just, you send Lazarus back from the dead? Enthusiasm. He still he still is an enthusiast in hell. <laughs> I, this is, he's still making it up. It's it's amazing. I mean. But it is interesting. Uh, I mean, putting your two comments together, that specifically Abraham says that there can't be any crossing through between hell and heaven and heaven and and hell that way. 
but he doesn't say that there can't be a connection between heaven and earth. And and your example of Moses and Elijah coming to earth said that that was not exactly a forbidden activity. Well, but I think it, with the transfiguration, it sort of holds that I mean, it, this is Christ. That this is not just, you know, I mean, even... The fact that Christ is there and, and he is able then to converse with those who have died should be no surprise. God has total conversation with all. And so so that, that to me is sort of, I mean, that's easy, only because it's Christ there. And this is no one else but, but God himself in conversation with those who are in heaven. So it, it makes perfect sense that he is able to bridge this gap between the saints here and the saints there. I, th I guess the uniqueness would be that uh, Peter, James, and John can actually see that right, as opposed right. to believing that. Yeah, so they've been given a vision of heaven uh, or they can actually see mm. what's going on. Um, but again, they, they, don't, they don't talk to Moses and Elijah. Only Christ does. Um, and then, then they're gone. So. And then Christ talks to, with them. Right, right. And I, I, I guess I just wonder if it's those types of stories in the Bible that give people the ideas of you know that their loved mm. ones are yeah, right. you know what I mean they, yeah. they can see us mm -hmm. that, that's again we always caution about things that are described in scripture as not being proscriptive the fact that those things happen doesn't mean that they happen all the time mm -hmm. that they're, they're God's common way of acting right. like Peter in the water just because Peter did it. <laughs> but, that, but really, that's what people, well, that's what yeah. happens if you take these things as, you know, well, Christians should be able to walk on water then, right? You know? What would Jesus do? Right? I should be able to fly up in chariots into heaven. Right? And that's, you know, all those things become, I, I like what Luther said. He said, if God, uh, if God isn't talking to you, then don't think it's your message. <laughs> We, we get we get to hear a lot of conversations in scripture that aren't addressed to us. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, thank you for coming out on a Sunday afternoon and thank you. It was very fruitful and beneficial to refresh our memories of our presentation the other day by Pastor Burfind and to stir our remembrance of it and to bring to mind uh, things that we see around us that remind us of Gnosticism and the dangers and perils that are around us because of it and uh, our need, as uh, Laurie said, to be in the Word and, and to recognize these things as being directly contrary to the Word of God, spiritually dangerous, and things that we want God to, to uh, provide protection for us and our families and communities against. And we need to stand up against it and, and to recognize it as evil and wrong and call it so wherever wherever we can to warn people. Pastor, would you close us with a word of prayer? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, you have given us the Holy Spirit to let us confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. We know this is of you. And we know that we are of God because we have this confession granted to us by your word. Protect us from all those who would say that Christ has not come in the flesh. We ask that you would also grant us mercy and pity so that we would look on them and give them the truth so that they would also see their own sin and receive the mercy of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God's peace go with you. Thank you, Pastor Billy.